which he has inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And let us hold fast the confession which is our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another, how to stimulate one another unto love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, encouraging one another and all the more as we see the day drawing near. Amen. Okay, good morning everybody. Uh, number 474 in your hymnal. Hope it's up there. Yeah. bow in prayer and confession of our sins. O most merciful God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth. O Lord, you know the depth of our hearts and all our desires. You know our frame, you know our weaknesses, and surely you know our sins. No secret can be hid from you. Your word tells us, though, that if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, you are faithful to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, Lord, we humbly bow our heads and confess that we have grievously sinned against you in thought, word, and deed this week, in things we've done outwardly, but also in the secret thoughts and desires of which are all known only to you. In the midst of your enemies and the sin that surrounds us, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy. So Lord, in your mercy, forgive us, cleanse us, and turn our hearts again to you in Selah.
Lord, hear our prayer and confession and grant us forgiveness and deliverance through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose glorious name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear now the good news. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The priesthood stood daily ministering and offering sacrifices time after time, but it could never take away sins. But he, having offered one sacrifice for sins, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies may made a footstool for his feet. For by that one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. In that one offering he established a covenant whereby his laws are upon our hearts and minds and our sins and lawless deeds are remembered no more. And where there is forgiveness of sins, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, by the blood of Jesus, we can now have confidence to draw near to him now. So brothers and sisters, having truly confessed our sins, God himself promises you the forgiveness of the Father the victory of the Son, and the glory and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Believe this and rejoice. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. The reading of God's word this morning begins in Genesis chapter 15. <clears throat> Genesis 15, beginning in verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. After these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram, I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And Abram said, O Lord Yahweh, what wilt thou give me, since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Since thou hast given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of Yahweh came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who shall come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Then he believed in Yahweh, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am Yahweh who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. And he said, O Lord Yahweh, how may I know that I shall possess it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds. And the birds of prey came down upon the carcasses and Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram and behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. And God said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed four hundred years. But I will also judge the nation whom they will serve, and afterward they will come out with many possessions. And as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. And it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. On that day, Yahweh made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenite and the Kenizzite and the Kadmonite, and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Rephaim, and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Girgashite and the Jebusite. Turn now to the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 3 and read verses 1 through 12. <clears throat> Matthew 3, verse 1. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is one, the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt about his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem was going out to him in all Judea and all the district around the Jordan, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? 
Therefore, bring forth fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that God is able to, from these stones, to raise up children to Abraham. And the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. And he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Please turn now to the back of your bulletin. We'll read together Psalm 106. Psalm 106. Praise the Lord. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Who can utter the mighty deeds of the Lord or declare all his praise? Blessed are they who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. Remember me, O Lord, when you show favor to your people. Help me when you save them, that I may look upon the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. Both we and our fathers have sinned, we have committed iniquity, we have done wickedness. Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love, but rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make known his mighty power. Their enemies oppressed them, and they were brought into subjection under their power. Many times he delivered them, but they were rebellious in their purposes and were brought low through their iniquity. Nevertheless, he looked upon their distresses when he heard their cry. For their sake, he remembered his covenant and relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love. He caused them to be pitied by all those who held them captive. Save us, O Lord our God, and gather us from among the nations that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Join me in singing number 274, Our God, Our Help in Ages Past.
We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him, <clears throat> through him all things were made, and for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, he became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made human. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried. The third day he rose from the dead according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection and to life in the world to come. Amen? Amen. Father, now we turn to your word, and uh, we're grateful that you talk to us, and we're grateful that your words have power, unlike our words, to transform us. And we pray that you would vivify us by your word this morning, make us new, strengthen us, and prepare us to sit at your table. This we pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, I was listening to uh, someone here the other day on the radio, and uh, this person was answering a question from a young person, quite young, under five years old, who was asking the question, is uh, Jesus in heaven right now, uh, getting heaven ready for us, making rooms for us? And uh, this person said, that is correct. That is what John 14 says. This is what Jesus is doing. Well, of course, when you read the text, you might think that that is accurate, but it actually is not accurate. Jesus prepared heaven by going, and his going was an ascent upwards, starting at the cross, where he paid the penalty for our sins, and that is how he prepared heaven for us. We have some, uh, maybe some funny views of heaven. The Bible doesn't say a whole lot about heaven. And we have a very platonic view of heaven. And uh, since, I don't know, the Reformation or thereafter, we have shrunk the gospel into believing in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins and going to heaven when we die. Well, it's true that to be with the Lord when we die we have to believe that Jesus paid for our sins at the cross and that he was buried and that he rose again. But the Bible never says anything quite like going to heaven. The Bible has a lot more to say about hmm, being transformed, and with a lot of promises about how this world is going to change. 
And uh, we're looking at that a bit in Galatians, just a bit, and we'll see some of that today. We're in chapter 3 of Galatians, and I invite you to turn there. The Bible is, uh, 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 it's my term, I've used it, you've heard me use it. The Bible is earthy, straightforward, doesn't pull any punches, isn't as reticent as we may be when it comes to uh, speaking in strong language. Uh, I recently got myself in trouble over literal interpretation of the Bible because I used a word three times to, to say that uh, to say one should always translate literally is not accurate. Today, uh, I'm going to get myself in trouble again, but fortunately, Paul's going to do it for me. I won't have to do it. And uh, these, these two things, literal interpretation and uh, one family, are two things that are foundational to dispensationalism. Now, let me say it the right way for you. And remember, I uh, went to Dallas sem Seminary, and I, I studied under John Walford, Charles Ryrie, uh, Stanley Toussaint, Dr. Pentecost, and I was an avid adherent to dispensationalism, came to McKinney Bible Church, taught dispensationalism for a long time, and then... Uh, began to think and read and commiserate and be agitated and uh, my views have changed. So for one thing I do believe in a literal interpretation of the Bible but literal means literal when it's supposed to be literal and symbolic when it's supposed to be symbolic and of course in the Christian community across the world, we, we dispute about when it should be literal and when it should be symbolic. But the Bible is written in a lot of symbolism. So if you asked Charles Ryrie, and you said to him, okay, so what, what are the fundamentals of dispensationalism? He would list five of them off for you, and then he would say, but the sine qua non of dispensationalism is this. Literal hermeneutics and a separation between Israel and the church. Paul says today in chapter 3, well, our translations say, you foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? You foolish Galatians. Now, it's true. None of us would like to be called foolish, would we? And if somebody came and said, Craig, you're a fool, and pointed out the area in which I was a fool, I, I probably initially would react to that. Well, the word can be translated, and it depends on what version of the Bible you pick up. It can be translated you ignorant Galatians. The word actually in Greek means you don't have a brain. <laughs> You're mindless. But given the context of what's going on in Galatians, uh, translators are, are want to give it a little emphasis. So they say, you foolish Galatians, and it's used twice in chapter 3, verse 1 and verse 3. And some people would uh, translate it witless. I heard that translation uh, two days ago. And some might translate it stupid. Now, all, all those things are possible. I didn't say them. The word is annoyate. Well, that sounds like being annoyed, doesn't it? Well, I hope you're not annoyed with that. <laughs> but... Galatians chapter 3 uh, comes, let me give you just a profound observation, after chapter 2. And at chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. 
in the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Well, those are famous verses. And of course, hopefully everybody in this room can say just such a thing. Christ delivered himself up for me, and my life has been transformed. So even though I'm living in the flesh, I'm living through, you could translate it either way. You can translate it through faith in the Son of God, or you can translate it by the faithfulness of the Son of God. And we're going to see, hopefully if we get far enough in chapter 3 here today, that, that, that that's, that's something we, we need to consider. Okay, so then he says, so I don't, I don't nullify, I don't overthrow what's going on, because if righteousness... You might want to translate it justification. If righteousness comes by law, Christ died needlessly. Well, you see, if you just took out the chapter division and then you went to the next verse, you'd say, you foolish Galatians. Why are they foolish? Because they're deciding Christ's death wasn't sufficient. One has to be circumcised. Now, don't misunderstand me. When I say it's not sufficient, I don't mean that they think, oh, your sins are forgiven some other way. That is not what they think. They think Christ died on the cross for sin. But because of the false doctrine running around during this 40 years, they're thinking, well, you can't really be in God's family. You can't really be saved unless you're circumcised. That's the issue. Now, you can understand, and we've said this before, how they might conclude such a thing because in Genesis chapter 17, God gives to Abraham the covenant of circumcision and he says you must circumcise your boys the eighth day, all those who are in your house, whether you bought them or they're born to you, you must circumcise them on the eighth day and I will be their God and they shall be my people and if you don't do this, they will be cut off from your people. Well, now, we have to figure out then how can you then come along and say circumcision is unimportant? Or, as Paul says at the end of the book, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. But that's what's at stake here. That's what the issue is all about. And we've looked at this, but let me just uh, read with you and we'll make our way down. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing, hearing the message and believing? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he then, who provides you with the Spirit, do it by the works, and works miracles among you, do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? You foolish Galatians, I came, I portrayed Christ as crucified, you heard the message, you believed, and miracles have been happening among you. It's evident you have received the Spirit of God, and now you want to add circumcision? Are you going to be made somewhat better by the flesh? By cutting off a little skin? Or... Is righteousness actually by faith in Jesus Christ. Now, notice in verse 6, he says, 
Even so, Abram, so he's continuing what he said because he's still talking about faith and he's talking about the foolishness of the Galatians and trying to remind them that what has happened came about because they have trusted Christ, the Son of God who gave himself for them. And, and, and now they're nullifying what Jesus said. It's become needless because now they're adding to it circumcision. So what happens this even as is it, it, it's hard to hard to translate this word in this translation, but what he's doing is he's narrating the Galatians into the Abraham story. This is their story. And when he's narrating them into Abraham's story, he's not only narrating Jewish people into that story, he's narrating Gentile people into that story. So he says, even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. Now, we're, we know that verse. It goes all the way to back to Genesis chapter 15. And, and so now I'm going to have to remind you one more time one of the things I've been saying because, you know, I haven't been up here for five weeks. And I forgot what I was saying. So, so if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 15... Abraham is uh, worried about God because he's only, he doesn't have an heir. The heir is a slave in his house. And God says, no, no, that's not what's going to happen. You're going to have an heir of your own. And so he takes him outside and he says, look up into this. And he looks up. And if you can count the stars, well, you know, now, now we who have been struggling through Revelation, now, now we have a new appreciation for this. Because count doesn't simply mean one, two, three, four, five. The word actually means to relate or to understand. Now, the number of the stars is important, but Abraham is looking up. And what does he see? He sees Israel in the heavens. And when you get to Revelation chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 15, there are the star signs that have everything to be able to do to look up there and find 12 constellations that are the 12 tribes of Israel and so forth. And it's beyond all that. So just keep that in mind. So Abraham looks, he considers, he, and he believes. Oh, this is what my seed will be like. And so God reckons it to him as righteousness. Now, we have taken that, as Paul has, and we've moved it into Romans, and we've, uh, we've come down to our little understanding, I don't mean little as in insignificant, our understanding of justification by faith in Jesus Christ. And that understanding is essentially correct. But Romans is written after Galatians. Galatians comes before, and it does not have the same storyline. It doesn't have the same explanations as Romans. So it tells us, oh, wait, maybe we should think a little broader. And then I reminded you that when you look at Psalm 106, verse 29, 28 and 29, the very same expression, the only other time it's used in the Bible, in the Old Testament, is used in connection with Phineas, who in the midst of a plague because the Jewish boys were being seduced by the Moab girls, and uh, one couple came into the tent, and Phineas went in because people were dying from a plague from God, and he took a spear and he thrust it through the two of them while they're joined together. Now they're forever joined together in death, in eternal death. And it was reckoned to him for righteousness unto all generations. And when we go back and we look at the account, like in Numbers chapter 25, God said he's given a covenant of peace because he was jealous for his God with jealousy. And it will be a perpetual priesthood to him to all generations. So being reckoned righteous in Phineas's life did not mean what we mean in Romans. 
Well, then we recognize again in Genesis chapter 15 that as soon as these words are said, then comes the Abrahamic covenant. And so what we're saying, what I'm saying, you, you may not buy it. I hope you do in the end, but what I'm saying is dikaioi, righteous, translated justified, justification in Galatians is more focused on covenant than a legal standing. This is a familial passage, not a legal passage. Well, when you read down through chapter 3, we're going to discover that's just what the whole point of chapter 3 is. It is a familial passage. So look back down then in uh, verse 6. Even so, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. Some of your translations may children. That's not the correct translation. It is sons. Okay, so now we're not talking about sperma in the sense of creating life. Now we're talking about faith creating life and whoever is of faith, and it doesn't say Jew or Gentile, that's his very point, is Abraham's son. Now, if you're a son, what does that make you? Well, when we get down to the end, he's going to tell us what it makes you. It makes you an heir of the promise. Whose promise? Abraham's promise. So right here, starting in verse 7 and running all the way down. So we got all these verses in between. We'll see if we can corral them. I think we can. And, and, and we can already see. Book ends. Smash it all together. And what's he saying? You foolish Galatians, don't you understand that apart from circumcision, through faith, you are a son of Abraham and therefore an heir of Abraham's promise. That's the point of the passage. Now, you see, if you adopt that, then you got to step back and say, wait a minute. This, uh, this one eschatology over here says the sign quinon is the separation of Israel from the church. Can't be done. It just cannot be done and work your way through Galatians 3. All right, enough of that. Probado. Verse 7, therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham and the scriptures, which is a paraphrastic way of saying God, and God for, and I, I shouldn't say it here, that, that doesn't work out, you can't do it that way, and the scriptures for seeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel to uh, beforehand to Abraham saying all the nations shall be blessed in you so then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer now we really don't have to go any further except Paul's going to explain some things you, you already see, just by taking this end, you know, like when you read a book, you go to the beginning, you go to the end, you, and, and it's supposed to bring everything together. We already said, well, here's what the end says. You're Abraham's seed, and therefore, heirs according to promise. Abraham's seed means what? Abraham has only one family. Or, another way to put it is, God only has one family. He doesn't have two. He doesn't have a purpose for one group over here and another purpose for another group or not. One purpose on the land, another pur purpose in the heavens. No, you cannot do that and be true to Scripture. At least, that's my estimation. And uh, there are plenty of people who disagree with me who are my friends, so... Don't take it personal. For as many as are of the works of the law, 
These are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Okay, well, that comes from, that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 27. And, of course, nobody can do that. And so everybody is under a curse. Now, what is Paul trying to do? He's just been talking about the people who are the sons of Abraham. And back in chapter 2, he says, you know, I, 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 this is how righteousness comes by faith. But now he's talking about a curse. Well, he's, he's going to show us how you get from Abraham down to people like you and me, assuming that most in this room are Gentiles. So he says in verse 11, now that no one is justified, now here's our word righteous, and I'm suggesting that it, in Galatians, it has to do with covenant, and you and I can understand that because of a marital covenant, we know that two come together and make one family. So here we're talking about coming into the Abrahamic covenant, being a part of the family. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident for the righteous, the justified man shall live by faith, taken from Habakkuk chapter 2. However, the law is not of faith. Well, that's a true statement. Keeping law is not faith. Keeping law is doing the law. On the contrary, he who practices them shall uh, he who practices them shall uh, live by them. Taking from Leviticus chapter eighteen and verse five, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And then here's the interesting thing. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So now he's drawn us back to the thing that concerns him, Gentiles. How do they come into this Abrahamic family? And he's just explained it to us. So, God created a world. Adam sinned. The world's messed up. God chose a family. God chose a family to work through to set the world right. The problem is the family that God chose had the same disease that every other family had. And so, he's showing us God chose his family, and they're all cursed. And now, Christ comes, and he takes away the curse of the law. Now, mind you, if you look at verses 11 through 14, he is not talking about Gentile. The law is not the Gentile's law. The covenant does not belong to Gentiles. The Mosaic covenant is Jewish only. Gentiles are not cursed under that law because it wasn't given to us. Now, I'm not saying Gentiles are sinless or that they're not cursed. I'm just saying he's not talking about Gentiles. He's following a train from Jewishness down to Gentileness in order that Christ, uh, in order that Christ Jesus uh, bless... Uh, let me read it again, for 14. In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. And then notice so that we, now he's talking about the Jews, might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. In other words, this had to go all the way down to Gentiles and they had to be blessed and together Jew and Gentile will get the Abrahamic blessing which in one part is the Holy Spirit. And that did not happen until the day of Pentecost. All right, 15 through 18, just quickly. 15 through 18 is about covenant and law. And he's going to use the illustration of a human covenant, but it's, it's an illustration. He's talking about the Abrahamic covenant. He says, brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is a, even though it is 
only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now, the promise was spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Okay, so in a human covenant, you don't change the conditions. Well, he's really talking about the Abrahamic covenant. So Abraham was given a covenant, and God spoke it to him. And it was spoken to him and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, referring to many, but to one and to your seed that is Christ. Now remember where we're going. We're going down to the end. He's going to tell us, you're sons of Abraham. You're Abraham's seed. Seed is a collective term, just like family is a collective term. And knowing where we're going, we know that he's using the word seed not simply to refer to the individual Jesus Christ, but to refer to Jesus Christ corporately. Is Christ divided, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.13? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, oh, he's the body of Christ and we're members of him. You see, Jesus is a family. We're part of his family. So when it says, no, he doesn't say to seeds, he says to seed. In other words, he means there's only one family. There's not one family here, one family here, one family there. No, there's only one family. What I am saying is this. The law, which came 430 years later, does not uh, invalidate a covenant previously ratified to, by God so as to nullify the promise. And here's the conclusion. For if the inheritance, now notice he picks up the word inheritance, that's going to come at the end of the chapter, your heirs as Abraham's seed, heirs by promise. For if the, for if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise, but God has uh, granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. So what he's saying is, okay, you foolish Galatians, you came to faith, you're sons of Abraham without circumcision, but somebody's convinced you that's not good enough to get into Abraham's family. You've got to be circumcised. A law was added, but it can't nullify the promise. So Paul says in verse 18, no, nah, it was granted as a promise, the inheritance, the blessing. To you and to your seed, I give blah, blah, blah. In you and in your seed, all nations of the earth, all families of the earth will be blessed. What is that blessing? It is the inheritance. What is the down payment of that inheritance? Well, he doesn't say it here, but you can kind of surmise it. It's the Holy Spirit. The Galatians had received the Holy Spirit, and now they think they need to do something else. It's not been good enough. Now look at verse 19. So you can see then in verses 15 through 18, you have covenant and law. How do they go together? Well, covenant is based on a promise, and you can stick a law right in there, but it cannot change the promises. That's his point. The promise still remains. God made a promise to Abraham and to his seed that all the nations of the earth would be blessed in him, and that promise still stands. Look at verse 19. Why the law then? It was added because of transgression, having been ordained through angels, by the agency of a mediator until the seed should come to whom the promise 
had been made. The promises to Abraham and to his seed. He doesn't say seeds. He says seed to his family. When does the family come? Well, clearly it comes when Christ comes. And you and I who have believed, as he's going to tell us at the end, we've been baptized into Christ. We're in Christ. And if we're in Christ, we are Abraham's seed. So, why the law? Why was the law added? It was added because of transgression. Now, back up in chapter 2, verse 15, uh, Paul says of the Jews, we're Jews by nature, and we're not sinners from among the Gentiles. So you have two different words. There are lots of words, but two we're dealing with in Galatians. You have the word sin, and everybody's a sinner. And you have the word transgression. Everyone's not a known transgressor. A sinner is somebody who does wrong things but may not know it's wrong. It's like your little kid. You know, you have to teach them what's wrong. Sometimes they go ahead and do it when they know it's wrong. That's for sure. But sometimes they do things that are, uh, well, implicitly wrong. But you have to teach them it's wrong. You have to teach them. Well, a sin is just, it means to miss the mark. And Gentiles are just missing the mark all the way around because they don't know anything about God. But Jews do know something about God, yet they're still sinners. But the law came along to turn sin into transgression. Transgression means you know it's a sin and you step over the line anyway. You've transgressed. And that's what Romans chapter 7 is about. Making sin known as transgression so that it can be dealt with. Unfortunately, we're transgressors. Why the law then? It was added because of transgression. Well, he's speaking cryptically. So he must mean law was added so that Jewish people would know that things they were just missing the mark on, once they know it, they know they're actually violating what God says. It's a transgression. Having been ordained by angels by the agency of a mediator. So we don't have time to talk about this, but he's telling us that the law came through angels. And we know that from Hebrews, we know that from Acts chapter 7, and we know it here from Galatians, and what exactly that means. Well, that would take a long time, but it, they're, they're doing God's work in administering the law. And uh, this law was given through angels by a mediator. And then it says, now, verse 20, look at 20. Now, a mediator is not for one party only, but God is only one. Now, in, in, in Greek it says, it says the mediator is not the mediator for the one, but God is one. Now, what's he talking about? The mediator is not the mediator for the one, but God is one. Well, the mediator, we know who that is. That's what the law is all about. It is about Moses. He's the mediator. But Moses was not a mediator for Gentiles and Jews, this one family. He was just for Israel. That's all he was for. In fact, his work with the law was not to bring Jew and Gentile together. His work with the law was to make sure Jew and Gentile stayed separate. All those laws are given to keep them in their land, keep them away from Gentile people. Not that, not that it was wrong to mix with Gentiles. That, that's certainly not the case. But God gave them a law that was a, on one hand, it's a, it's a, well, no, on every hand. It's a wonderful law. The Jews had the privilege of going, taking all these laws so that they could come and meet with God. Nobody else had that privilege. But having that privilege... This uh, law also separates them from all the nations around them, and they're told that they're supposed to be separate, and that's what Moses does. He keeps them separate. Now, a mediator, or the mediator, is not the mediator for the one, but God is one. Well, what does that mean? 
Well, he's telling us, Jew and Gentile alike are in one family. God has one family. Moses isn't the mediator for that. Jesus Christ is the mediator for that. Now, a mediator is not the mediator for the one, but God is one, as it says in Romans. Is God the God of the Jews? Yes, the God of the Jews. Is God the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles. Yet God is one. In other words, Jews are saved through faith. Gentiles are through, saved through faith. Jew and Gentile are in one family. Is the law then contrary to the promise of God? May it never be. For if law had been given, which was able to impart life, then righteousness covenant relationship would indeed have been based on law but instead scripture has shut up all men under sin that the promise by faith in jesus christ might give to those might be given to those who believe so god gave this law and the, the word shut up means to take a net and capture a bunch of fish in them, and they're stuck. That's what happened to Israel. They come into the promised land. They have this law, and it has encircled them and captured them. Why? Well, because God has a long-range plan. And the long-range plan is to bring salvation through the Jewish people. But the Jewish people have the same disease you and I have, and that's the disease of, disease of sin. So God shuts them up in sin and, and cloisters them separate from the nations so that they won't go totally to the bad until the promised one has come, until the promise comes to fruition. And the promise comes to fruition in Jesus Christ. That may not be crystal clear, but if you follow the pronouns, if you follow the words, then you discover, ah, we're headed down this trail of one family. My clock says I have five minutes. We'll see what that means. Now, look at what it says here. Verse 23. But before faith came... We were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Now, what does it mean before faith came? People get all mixed up here. Wait a minute. Faith hadn't come? Abraham had faith. David had faith. Lots of the Old Testament people have faith. And then you say, faith has not come? That's because Paul is using the word faith as a synecdoche for all of God's plan. And who is the faith, the faithful one? Well, it's Jesus Christ. But before faith came, we, that is, not Gentiles, Jewish people, we were kept in custody. We were confined. We were guarded with the law being shut up to the faith which was later to be, well, the word is revealed. It's an apocalypse. When Jesus Christ came, he revealed the Father, and everything was opened up for us to understand it. Look at verse 24. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. Look at it, it's we, that we may be justified by faith. Okay? So Paul, Paul is talking about Jewish people now. They're all confined until faith comes. Before faith comes, they have the law. The law is turning all sin into transgression. The law is confining the people. They have, they have circumcision that sets them apart. They have table food laws that sets them apart they have cleanliness laws that set them apart and, and all of this is a gift also because in those they get to go to the house of god and meet with god in part therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to christ 
that we may be justified by faith. Well, now the word tutor is the word from what we get pedagogue, and pedagogue can be a teacher. Pedagogue is a teacher, a teacher of children. But it's being used here, and there are differences of opinion. Uh, the differences don't make that much difference. But probably the pedagogue here means something like a babysitter, a babysitter. So it's not the person who actually does the teaching. It's not the parent. It's a babysitter. So the Jewish people in the Old Testament are like children, and they have a babysitter that leads them around, takes us to go up to the temple to worship, takes us here, takes us there. It's not the teacher per se. But now that faith has come, look at that. Before faith came, now that faith has come, a huge difference. First, they're being babysat, and uh, they have this tutor, which is the law, and the law is confining them in as sinners and turning their sin into transgression. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. In other words, okay, when Abraham came, he's given this wonderful Abrahamic covenant that's full of promise for his family. That family includes the nations and the families of the earth, Jew and Gentile alike. That's all Abraham's family. And now he's saying, okay, that law had a shelf life. It was time-limited it had its purpose, but as soon as faith comes, its purpose has ended, which means circumcision has passed. Food laws have passed. Cleanliness laws have passed. All these things that uh, so interest the Jewish people that set them apart, you know, there are other cultures that said, don't lie, don't murder, don't steal, those kinds of things. But these laws set them apart it, it, to hold them in, to confine them, to keep them from going really bad. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. In other words, Galatians, the law is over. That's amazing. The law is over. Well, then, how's one going to make it in life? Who's going to be their guide? Who's going to lead? Well, it's not going to be the law. Now, mind you, I'm not saying the law has no value. Paul's not saying the law has no value. He's using a kind of illustration. Because now that the promise, if, if faith has come, the promise has come, and the promise, well, in its down payment form, is the Spirit. And we'll see, that's what, chapters, that's what the first seven verses in chapter 7 are going to talk about, the coming of the Spirit. Okay, it, it's time to quit, but let's just read these last verses. And I, I'd like you to notice, when you go home, just start at verse 23 and read all the way down through 26, or start at 22 and read all the way down through 26, and just look at the word faith, 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 faith. And that, when, that, when we're done here, there's almost no more words of faith in the book of Galatians. And remind yourself, before faith came, faith goes all the way back. Now, he's not talking about whether people believe or not. He's talking about the faith, the faithful one. And that's why then in chapters 2 and 3, you begin to see, oh, uh, you, you don't know whether to translate it as faith in Jesus Christ or the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. And Paul probably wouldn't care if you said, well, it's both. When faith came, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Well, then, that's, that's where our faith rests. So Jesus Christ is faithful to what God sends him to do. And in like manner, we're faithful to trust Christ. Before faith came, we are under tutor. Now that faith has come, no more tutor. No more law. No more circumcision, you Galatians. You witless Galatians. Suppose they like that. Probably not. <laughs> the Bible is rather frank. 
Okay, let's just read to the end here, and then we'll pick this up next week. Notice what he says. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Wow, is that supposed to be faith in Christ Jesus? Or the faithfulness of Christ Jesus. Well, if you don't know Greek, you won't know. You can translate it either way. Well, so maybe Paul means both. Because if Jesus Christ is not faithful, our faith in him is worthless. So he is the faithful one. He is the faith that comes. And now, corresponding to what he has done, we've been drawn to him to respond in faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed, have clothed yourselves with Christ. We'll talk about that. Baptism is one of those. Uh, uh, Paul never explains the relationship between baptism and faith in all that he writes, not even in Romans chapter 6. Baptism is, well, it's a problem for us. We believe in baptism. How to articulate it becomes a problem. But we'll see what we can do next week. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. When they were baptized in those days, they were baptized and then they put on new clothes. Well, the new clothes are symbolic because Ephesians and Colossians tell us that's exactly what happens when we come to Christ. We're dressed new. We're dressed in Christian clothes. And so, you know, we, we live in the intellectual age. We don't much like symbolism. Wouldn't it be something if somebody came up out of this tub and we handed them a new set of clothes? Would it, would, it, would it mean something? Well, yes, symbolically it would mean something. But we'd say, oh, what's the point of that? Well, that's what Christians did in the early days. Uh, there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus now, we'll explain why that's important. And if you belong to Christ, here's the QED, then you are Abraham's seed, Abraham's family, heirs according to promise. Isn't that fabulous, fantastic? Now, hear what I'm saying. It means that little strip of land over there in the Middle East is yours. Well, more than that, because when you get to Romans chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 13, Paul turns that little strip into where Abraham was promised the world. Well, you know, if I, if I uh, put in my will that Caleb is going to inherit a million dollars, and then I die and he gets 10 million, would he complain? Would he say, oh, that's not what you said? No, he'd say, I'm, thank you, Dad, that you're a little nuts. Yeah, we're heirs, one family, Jew and Gentile alike. Lots of implications. Now, mind you, I, I just want to make this uh, statement. This is not personal with me. If you're here and you believe in dispensationalism, where there's the church and there's Israel with God's two different purposes, well, you have to do what you see in the Bible. You need to hear what I'm saying, think it through. But you know what? Another theme of Galatians is unity. We're all one in Christ. We don't all run our families alike. We don't all think alike. We don't all believe alike. But we're all one in Christ. And so we're not going to pick on each other. We're going to get vehement every now and then about our position and probably over vehement sometimes. But, you know, then you walk away and you say, well, it's like you had a little scuffle with your wife. You know, tempers flared a little bit. Do you love her less when it's over? Now. <laughs> you both forgive, forget, and move on. Let's stand.
Well, Father, we thank you that faith has come. And we are the beneficiaries of that faith on this side of the cross. Our Savior was faithful to you. You sent him into the world and you handed him over to sinners to put him to death on a cross as the propitiation for our sins. And because of his faithfulness, in like manner, we now have faith in him. And we want you to keep us faithful. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please sing with me the God of Abram praise. The God of Abram praise, whose reigns on throned above, ancient of everlasting days, and God of love, Jehovah great I am, by earth and heaven confess. I bow and bless the sacred name forever. The God of Abram praise, who through supreme command from earth I rise and seek the joys at his right hand. I shall on earth forsake his wisdom, fame, and power, and him my only portion make my shield and by himself has sworn I on his oath depend I shall on eagle's wings up for to him ascend I shall behold his face I shall his power adore and sing the wonders of his grace forever the godly land I see with beasts and plenty bless, a land of sacred liberty and endless stress. There milk and honey flow, and oil and wine abound, and trees of life forever grow with mercy. The God who reigns on high, the great archangels sing. O oh, holy, 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 cry, Almighty King, who was and is to save, and evermore shall be. Jehovah, Lord, the great I am, we worship. For the Savior's face, the ransomed nations, well, this is almighty grace, forever new. He shows his prints of love, they handle through the flame, and sound through all the world above the Lamb. The world triumphant hosts give thanks to God on high. Hail Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, they ever cry. Hail Abram's God and mind, I join the heavenly lays in might and majesty are the and end list praise. You may be seated. <laughs> 